and current BCE Endowment Trustee. I'm here with fellow trustee, Cindy Wright. Cindy, say hello. Hello. And Executive Director, Angela Dubovsky, who's working in the background. Uh, and on behalf of my fellow uh, endowment trustees, I'd like to warmly welcome you to Investing in the Future of Burlingame Speaker Series brought to you by the BC Endowment Council. Tonight, we're talking about climate change in Burlingame, what we're doing about it and how we're investing in the future. And we've put together a phenomenal program for you uh, with a great panel filled with Burlingame's expert on climate change. And we'll be recording this for future viewing. But before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to briefly tell you about the BCE Endowment. The Burlingame Community for Education Foundation, fondly known as BCE, is a 501c3 nonprofit founded almost 40 years ago. BCE provides the Burlingame School District with financial resources to create a rich and inspiring education for our children beyond what's possible with public funds as we are still 43rd in the nation when it comes to per student state funding. Each year, the annual campaign raises funds and then grants that money to the school districts starting back at zero every year. By contrast, the BCE Endowment Fund, which is part of BCE, is only five years old. And it's different in that the endowment's principal gets invested and its earnings would be able to support the BCE grant every year. The endowment fund enables us to leave a permanent legacy in perpetuity for our schools and achieve financial stability. When BCE's annual campaign falls short, income from the endowment would help to fill the gap. Now you can imagine in a year when BCE's fundraising gala and live auction and spirit run have all been canceled, when parents' job security is, feels fragile, in that kind of year, an a year exactly like this one, in fact, it becomes quite a bit more challenging for the annual campaign to raise its $2 million plus grant for the Burlingame School District. And these funds enormously impact the quality of our schools. And that's why we need an endowment for the Burlingame community for this financial stability. We are kicking off the BCE Endowment Campaign with this Future of Burlingame Speaker Series. We are so thrilled to have such expert panelists here tonight talking about climate change in Burlingame. And we are so grateful for every one of you in the audience tonight. Thank you, Sari. I'm Cindy Wright, and I'm honored to introduce this evening's panelists. We've handpicked tonight's panelists based on their expertise and leadership on climate change in Burlingame. You can read their full bios on the registration page, but rest assured, these are Burlingame's foremost authorities on climate change. Our first panelist is San Mateo County Supervisor, Dave Pine. Thank Hello, you. great to be here. Our second panelist is Burlingame Council Member and two-time former mayor, Michael Brownrigg. Michael, I'm give a little shout out. Uh -oh. He might be muted. There we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Thank you to BCE. Our next panelist is three-time former Mayor Terry Nagel, founder of Citizens Environmental Council and currently board chair of Sustainable San Mateo County. Welcome, everybody. And I was just a co-founder of the Citizens Environmental Council. It was a group effort. Great. Next, we have Sagal Michael, Sustainability Coordinator for the City of Burlingame. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. And our final panelist is Rusty Hopewell, the District Wellness and Sustainability Coordinator for Burlingame School District. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you all for joining us. We are great to have you here. Thanks, Cindy. So let's dive right into the subject of climate change in Burlingame. We received some really great, great questions from all of you for this panel. So why don't we kick things off with you, Sigal? Um, but by me, any by by all means, uh, our, to, this goes to all of our panelists. Please jump in um, if you'd like to contribute to answering any of the questions that I ask. 
So Seagal, many um, people have heard of the City of Burlingame Climate Action Plan 2030, also known as CAP. Can you tell me more about its development and who is involved in the shaping of this plan? Sure, yes. Often we get asked as a city, what are we doing for climate action? What's the city, what, what are, what's our future actions? And we actually have a blueprint document called the Climate Action Plan that sets out our goals and strategies over the next uh, decade. The Climate Action Plan really came um, in line with the city's general plan update. The city had a really old general plan update. They're usually updated regularly. We hadn't updated ours regularly. And um, we jumped on the opportunity to do our Climate Action Plan along with the general plan which means we also took advantage of the outreach and all the community involvement that happened with the general plan. People also got to comment on what they would like to see around sustainability and climate action. So the climate action plan has 20 measures in it that go from waste, energy, transportation, water conservation, and how and what the city is going to be doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in each of those areas. And we have a target. We aligned our target, which is a, a greenhouse gas emissions target with the state. So we want to reduce 40% of our emissions by the year 2030. So in the next 10 years, we want to reduce another 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions, which is ambitious, but we show in our climate action plan that it's doable. And it's doable for a large part because the state, we're lucky in California that they're so proactive and taking the lead on so many areas, but also regionally, we, um, one of our biggest emission reductions is from Peninsula Clean Energy. The fact that now all of you in Burlingame who are customers for electricity are now purchasing electricity generated from clean resources. As of January 2021, it's going to be 100% greenhouse gas free. That means our electricity comes from resources that don't burn fossil fuels. And that's a huge leap it's for- amazing. It's amazing. It's a huge leap for Burlingame, for San Mateo County, um, and for the Bay Area, other, other regions are following suit. So those kind of initiatives are really what's pushing our greenhouse gas emissions down for the future. But I urge all of you to visit our website. Um, we have, um, it's, you go to burlingame.org um, climate action plan and you'll see them there. And there's a lot of measures there, for example, um, you know, to in, for new homes to make sure they include EV chargers in their homes. Another one is as a municipal, we want to be a leader and we want to make sure all our new buildings are zero net energy. And we're seeing that play out. Our new community center is going to be zero net energy. That means that it is going to make as much energy through renewable as it uses. Now, the funding when the uh, community center went through came before this climate action plan was passed and the decision to make it zero net energy. So the city is now looking for funding to help pay for that renewable energy. It's in the plans to put solar panels on the buildings and they're looking at about $1.2 million to help fund to really um, live out that strategy and that vision to have a zero net energy community uh, centered locate, you know, that everyone gets to see and to lead um, by example. So at the end of the presentation, there'll be a website, Sari will show it to you, um, that uh, could, you could link to it and make any donations to help make the community center vision come true. Thank you, Sigal. Really appreciate that. And uh, I've taken a look at that um, plan online. It's very easy to find on Burlingame.org. And it's going to be a beautiful building. Yes, yes. Um, Supervisor Pine, you've asked me to call you Dave, so I will. <laughs> um, how are Burlingame and San Mateo County working together to impact climate change? And how, on top of that, do you get alignment with the state's goals? Well, the county plays an important role as really a convener of the cities. You know, in our county, we have 20 cities plus the, uh, the county of San Mateo. So when we tackle big issues like climate change or housing, the county can really play an important role in, in, in trying to bring uh, cities together to, to share expertise and, 
work on these issues kind of more regionally. So we've done just that when it comes to climate change and Berlin Games has been a big partner in the efforts. Uh, a couple of examples. Uh, there's a, a group that meets uh, monthly, it's, uh, it's called RICAPS, which means Regionally Integrated Climate Action Planning. And what this group does is it, it, it gets together with the help of the county to, to work on these climate action plans that Segal was discussing, because every city is adopting its own plan. So there's a lot of best practices that can be shared and there are certain tools that can be shared about how to you know, measure your carbon emissions and you know, setting up certain um, um, uh, templates for preparing these documents. Another example is the county a few years back formed uh, a, a new office called the Office of Sustainability. And uh, as, as, as is clear from its title, it's about all things sustainability, including, including reducing carbon emissions. And recently, um, uh, the Office of Sustainability together with Peninsula Clean Energy was really instrumental in working with the cities to push these, these uh, so-called REACH codes that Segal referenced to require um, new construction to be 100% uh, electric. So the county can really play a role in, in developing form, le form legislation uh, that cities can pick up on. You know, another example would be the food containers and food um, um, uh, take out uh, packaging. Uh, the county came up with an ordinance to, to regulate that and the cities are now considering it, including Burlingame. So again, the cities, the county can, and again, just kind of be a catalyst to work with Burlingame and other cities. And then when it comes to the goals, there are a lot of goals out there that the state has. And it's important that, you know, all our plans at a minimum meet those goals, but where we can, we should try to beat those goals because anywhere in the California where we should be more ambitious, you know, it's in a community like Burlingame. Um, so for example, the governor would like has set a goal of carbon neutrality by 2045. You know, I think we can do better than that. And uh -huh, uh -huh. So that's a challenge uh, in front of each city, including Burlingame. Yep. I agree. Um, Terry, what Hi there. Um, what is the focus of the Citizens Environmental Council and Sustainable San Mateo County? Both of these are 501c3 nonprofits, and I'm curious how they interact as well with local government and community organized efforts. Well, both of the nonprofits are focused on making sustainability happen. So, you know, these are feet on the ground, people who are volunteering to make change. Citizens Environmental Council grew out of the Green Ribbon Task Force that I formed when I was mayor back in, I think it was 2007. And um, Michael Brownrigg was on that task force too. <laughs> we started out thinking, oh, we're gonna do this. And now we had this big whiteboard and we were putting all these ideas up and thinking we could do everything at once. And then finally we realized that we had to have a climate action plan, which yeah. um, meant that you have to start thinking of ways to reduce carbon emissions, not just as one lady said, we should grow broccoli in every front yard. And <laughs> <laughs> we got to the point where we said, no, what's, you know, what's the difference in emissions? And so, um, we had one of the earlier climate action plans in the county. And from that, the group dissolved and became a local citizens group. Now we are a very active group. Michael knows this. We're always knocking on the door of trying to get new things done in the city. And um, the programs that we have are what we call the green programs on hot topic. They're free public programs on interesting topics. We also have a huge emphasis on helping youth get engaged and become sustainability leaders. And um, in fact, tell me, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, uh, yeah. In, in fact, um, Mike McCord, who I think is on this call, was instrumental in starting this climate ambassadors program, which gets students in high school working as interns. And they have to complete an actual project showing um, progress on sustainability. It has now been expanded by the county to be countywide, which is really impressive. We also have a film fest where we encourage students in grades four through 12 to enter 
uh, films on environmental topics. We have cash prizes. There's a training session, a free film workshop coming up this Saturday that people can, um, kids actually can sign up for and learn how to make the videos. And then we have the big celebration, the film fest in March. Um, in addition to that, um, we do work on, you know, policies and programs trying with very closely with Segal, actually trying to get the city to continue to make progress on issues. And then I'm running out of time, but Sustainable San Mateo County does a similar thing, but it's for the whole county. So what we're trying to do is a systems approach where we believe that the three E's of sustainability, that's the environment, social equity, and the economy have to be in balance in order to have a sustainable, healthy society. That makes so sense. We measure progress um, in all of the local cities. We do an annual, what we call indicators report launch, where we launch the information and share it with the public. And also work closely with the city leaders to get that information to them. And we have a new project called the Sustainability Ideas Bank, which is very exciting. We have been working very hard with Stanford interns for two summers now, collecting ideas on how cities can become sustainable based on successful ideas that have already been implemented in other cities. And we have the contact information that people can use to call up and say, hey, you know, how did you handle this problem? Or can I have a copy of your ordinance? So Love it. see that coming out soon. So I'll stop there. I think I'm probably out of time. No, 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 please. What you're saying is oh, so okay. interesting because it, <laughs> well, <laughs> because it really speaks to what uh, we in the community, how, how we in the community are able to engage, not just uh, right. these, our these, local government uh, officials. Groups are totally open to the public and the volunteers work very closely with um, local leaders in other environmental organizations, as well as local elected uh, officials. So it, it's it's really a wonderful network of, of very friendly and very committed people. As Sagal knows, these people, when we're working on issues like these reach codes you keep hearing us talk about, and I'll talk about that more later, but we have such strong support. It's just truly an amazing and very supportive structure for making our not only our city but our whole county more sustainable well and that's why Burlingame is such a special place to live we have so many people in our community who just get involved whether it's the schools or your initiatives and I encourage everybody on this call to check out Citizens Environmental Council they have a great website if you want to plug in there um, Michael are you with us I think you're muted. Yeah, you're yeah, I'm sure. Okay, waste great. Waste. Hi, Michael. Um, can you talk about our regional waste disposal program? I know that you're, um, you've had some important roles um, in the county there that I'd love for you to talk about, as well as our clean energy program um, that Seagal had mentioned. Uh, no, it was Seagal, yes, it was Seagal who mentioned it, um, that Burlingame residents can benefit from. I'd be delighted to, but I'm going to um, ex exert the privilege of a panelist and segue a little from Terry's remarks just to back up for a second. And I will, get, I will get to the question of waste. So first of all, I want to thank the BCE endowment. I think it's a great initiative. You know, we have, we put four kids through our amazing schools. And I know every elected official on this phone call believes very much in the virtuous circle between healthy, strong schools, healthy, strong city leads to healthy, strong schools. So um, thank you. And, and as I said to you privately, I really appreciate this kind of um, intellectual gathering of sorts. I think we ought to do more of it in Burlingame and I, I salute BCE for taking the initiative. So thank you. Um, I also wanna share, you know, I'm a 25 year resident. So, um, and when I came here, I really believe that there was a kind of strong and I'm not gonna put Terry on the spot, but I think there was a sort of strong inclination from local government, our leaders, that we were a suburb and our goal was to protect ourselves from other people coming in and really anything changing very much. Like our goal was to keep all the sidewalks perfect and everything else pretty much the same. And we didn't take a position on issues outside of our zip code and we didn't expect people outside our zip code to take any positions about what we were doing. 
And it was with leadership of people like Terry Nagel, but also frankly, this influx of a lot of you know, energetic young families coming here for great schools who said, you know, we really can do more. And I wanna say, I really believe that we can do more. I mean, the council, not that I was on, but I think Terry might've been on it, was a council that fought having Bart come to Burlingame because God, God forbid some of those people might be able to come to Burlingame. I mean, that was the kind of attitude, right? And so everyone on this call and, and Supervisor Pine is a, you know, a model of thinking beyond our zip code, beyond our county. And so, you know, and I really think we can. And so this is one reason why I want to, you know, appreciate the question about waste. So on waste, and I, I, I'll try to keep it, I can get very granular, which isn't pretty, um, but- Especially uh, when it comes to waste. Especially when it comes to waste. But we are part of an 11 city uh, cooperative um, and, the, and, and that, those 11 cities in San Mateo County are the ones who hire Recology, make sure our, the trucks come to your house, come to their business, pick it up. Uh, starting a couple of years ago, long before actually the state started sending mandates, we realized that a lot of organics were going into the black bin and the black bin basically goes to landfill and when organics, which is food waste, goes to landfill, it produces methane. And so instead of just waiting for somebody to create a mandate, what we did, and, and I, um, was, I was pleased that um, my electeds on the, and this is sort of to the point that I think all of us in San Mateo County see a chance to be bigger than our cities join me in creating a zero waste group. And by doing that, we then looked at what we could do. And we realized if we refinanced old bonds at today's lower interest rate, we could pull money out of those bonds and invest in new technology without adding $1 to any of your garbage rates, by the way. And that new technology does two things. It, it does a much better job pulling clean paper and recyclables out of landfill. So that generates money for all of us. And it also, more importantly, pulls the organic waste out of, land, out of the black bin. Um, and while individual homes might do a good job of composting, a lot of multifamily homes don't even have a green bin and a lot of um, enterprises don't have green bins. So a lot of food waste. So we've got new technology that we've just deployed that'll pull all of the organic waste out of the black stream, turn it into a slurry and convert it into renewable natural gas that will either be used to power our recology garbage trucks or else be used for a clean uh, renewable gas fuel. So pulling it out of landfill and converting it and using it. And um, all of those investments were made again by, by just smart financing. Um, and we very nearly won a green bond award uh, hmm. for the structure. So. Um, but this is really just the beginning. I think all of us working together, and again, I know this is Dave's vision, um, can be so much more powerful than any, any one of our cities alone. Um, and I'll finish with this thought, which is so often it is the hard work of a group like the CEC, or I'm thinking, I mean, it's a quasi, I don't know how you'll feel about it, it as an environmental issue, but the fact that we don't have leaf blowers every day which was an environmental issue and a noise pollution issue was driven by one citizen who did a lot of research and pushed and pushed and pushed and with CEC's help got us to pass. And, and I'm sorry, let me finish with this. You know, you're talking to an elected official who was a part-time person. You know, I, this is not my job. This is a passion, um, but I don't have a ton of staff. So I can't just come up with a good idea and do it. I, and so when citizens come forward with great ideas that, and, you've, and you've done the research, we can then push st our staff, people like Seagal, you know, and say, let's do this, let's move forward. Um, and so, you know, thanks to everybody on this call who's done that in the past. And, and let me just say our door is open to great ideas. So thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Michael. Rusty. Yeah. Speaking of the future of Burlingame, Rusty is involved with the Burlingame School District, our future environmentalists. Um, are you with us? Yes. Great. Um, we know that there's a healthy school environment and program and a green team program in the Burlingame School District, which you run. Tell us about how this relates to the to climate change big picture 
And how are you working with the city and the school? How is the city and the school district working together on climate goals so students can see the impact of what they're doing and learning in their schools and in the city? Okay. Yeah, there's uh, quite a few things that uh, at the Burlingame School District that we are doing that um, not necessarily projects directed at affecting climate change, but we've always got climate change at the backdrop of a lot of our projects we do with our green team and um, uh, our other environmental programs. Uh, starting at kind of a higher level, I know a, a lot of new construction has been occurring on all of our campuses. And I know that construction, I don't have the details because I'm not the one in charge of, of overseeing it, but a lot of it is done with green, uh, green materials. And almost all of our new construction usually ends up with solar arrays on all of the, the rooftops. So in that sense, we're trying to contribute, you know, energy efficiency uh, towards you know our, our climate goals. Sure. Um, for the green teams, uh, all of our schools have uh, an adult green team that engages a student green team, and each school kind of does a little bit uh, different with their green teams, different projects that they take on. Uh, one of our biggest focuses uh, of uh, of our green teams, particularly at, at BIS, which is our middle school, which is I'm in charge of um, leading that green team is waste reduction. Uh, the past couple of years, we've really been looking at you know, the waste that we're producing um, and is it being properly sorted into the different streams so it can be composted or, or recycled or does it need to go to landfill? Uh, so we've gotten a few grants over the past couple of years from the Office of Sustainability cool. for our grants that have allowed us to improve our collection systems. Just today, I, I took delivery of 20 uh, recycling and composting garbage cans we will now be placed throughout the campus so that we actually have the collection bins in place. Um, but we also do a lot of engaging the students on just letting them know, uh, or reminding them really on what is compostable, what is recyclable, how to sort their own waste. Um, one thing we do have at the Burlingame uh, Middle School Garden uh, is a, I call a thriving composting program. Um, I started yeah. that. A few Tell me more back. about that. Uh, I, a few years back, um, I, they, what, what, what started this was they actually put the new garden right next to where the uh, waste, the dumpsters are. My being in the garden, I was observing <laughs> all of this green waste yeah. that was really great material for creating compost just going into our our green dumpsters. You know, it's a good place for it to go, you know, much better than, you know, going into the landfill. But I then worked with the gardeners to siphon off that portion that I could easily compost on site, uh, all of our grass clippings. Um, and we, I, I have them collect um, and leave our in our garden. And then every fall, I get a huge mound of, of brown leaves. And then throughout the springtime, when all that grass clippings are coming in, I'm able to make several compost piles. Those compost piles are usually tended by students, but this, you know, this past year, um, we haven't had that uh, access to um, the student labor, I almost can call it. Um, and we do a, a lot of educational um, promotion around our composting program. Um, the other thing that we are doing, and this is where we actually are partnering uh, with the city of Burlingame. I know Seagal and I have talked about a few different projects uh, and have not really formed, I would say, a specific partnership. Um, but the one that we do have is with the Burlingame Police Department. Uh, they provide us with all of their unclaimed bicycles that we then, I have uh, a Safe Routes to School grant, which is through our uh, County Office of Ed. Uh, that allows me to fix those bikes. I work with, or would we would normally work with students after school as an after school program, fixing those bikes and then just giving them back out to our, our community. Um, people would come in, it's our called adopt a bike program. They would come in, tell us which bike they would like. We fix it, you know, put it. Machines, clean it up, get it running, and then just give it for free uh, along with a helmet and a lock. 
uh, back out to our, our community. And that's been a great partnership with the, the police department because uh, that's been a steady flow of bicycles um, for us. Not all of them in the great best of shape, but some of them are, are, are fairly nice. So um, in the end, it works out well, I, I believe for everybody. And you're really engaging the students, which is what yes. your goal is, right? Yeah, um, and I, I, I particularly like that program because it engages students, particularly those students that, you know, do better with hands-on outside the sure. classroom type learning. Sure, sure, sure. So I, I tend to get a lot of those students interested um, in coming to our after-school program. Great. Um, and, and there's a lot more I could probably keep going on, but I think I'll, I'll leave it there in the interest of time. And I appreciate you allowing me to, to brag a little bit. Great. No, I love the bragging. Um, it's inspiring to know that our students are starting so much younger than any of the rest of us on this call started thinking about the environment. They are leading us through this, I think, in many ways. Um, next question is kind of a big one. So I'm going to throw this out to both you, Michael, and to you, Seagal. Um, we know that the solution to climate change rests in the hands of individuals and businesses and the city. Tell us about what Burlingame has the power to do now and over the next 10 years to affect change. And if you wouldn't mind in your explanation, addressing the disposable food container issue in the process. Sigal, so I'll, I, please, I'll let you go first. Okay, I can go first. Um, well, I think, you know, there's a lot more, you know, we have this climate action plan that's going to get us a good chunk of greenhouse gas reductions. But if we really want to see big things happen, bigger actions need to occur. We saw, you know, through this pandemic that greenhouse gas emissions reduced quite a lot worldwide due to the complete, you know, almost, like I guess, slowdown or halt, you know, of transportation right. and manufacturing. And so while us, you know, me driving my Prius and taking my recycling out is good for the environment, it's not going to get the dent we want, you know, that we need as we saw in the pandemic, what it really takes. So it really, it's talking about transitioning and shifting to, to just a total carbon free um, future. Hmm. We've as I mentioned before, Peninsula Clean Energy is helping us do that in our electricity usage and all new electricity, you know, that we have um, is all going to be greenhouse gas free, but many of us in our homes still use natural gas and existing homes is going to be a big challenge for um, the city and for citizens and how we eventually move away from natural gas for everyone um, to, to really reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the city is gonna be looking, you know, at other cities, at regions, at state, you know, and how that's gonna happen. And, it, and it'll take, you know, a lot of action from all of us to be willing to do that. And of course, you know, it's transportation. Um, the transportation stopped, you know, greatly reduced through this pandemic. We saw the reductions not just in greenhouse gas emissions, but in smog and pollution and um, associated health risks. So, um, you know, envisioning an electric based transportation is really what we're moving toward. Um, we are trying to put in electric chargers now all over the city. We're looking at grants to help us do that. We imagine growing. Right now we have 12, I am, you know, I just prepared an uh, electric, an EV um, action plan where I hope to see a hundred um, EV chargers in the city in the next by 2025. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, and you know, Gavin Newsom has an executive order that by 2035 uh, in 15 years, no more gas vehicles um, to be sold in California. So we're just talking about a huge trans transition. So um, while you know, our everyday actions matter a lot. Our bigger actions, you know, what we choose to buy, uh, the packaging we choose. If, you know, for all of you that are similar, <laughs> sustainably minded, you know, sometimes these purchasing choices are paralyzing. Do I get this wrapped in plastic or do I get the organic option? <laughs> you know, why does that have to be the choices? I think we could all do so much better 
regarding packaging, the, the, the food service that you mentioned. Um, right. Burlingame passed and over the, um, the council meeting in Earth Day, the week of Earth Day, the two uh, following the county's lead and, and you know, um, using their ordinance for no more disposable foodware in, for takeout in restaurants. Due to COVID and so much other pressure that restaurants are undergoing, that enforcement date is being pushed to March um, of 2022. So it's in quite a bit of time, but that doesn't mean that work isn't happening. The county is working so hard to get those options, the education, the outreach, and we're, we're along for the ride, you know, reaching out to our restaurants. And, and we hope by 2022, there'll be many more options for a restaurant to be able to choose between. So we won't see any more of those plastic clam shares or black plastic. I think Michael could agree, like just um, at Recology, they don't recycle black plastic. Like, why do we see that in our county still? And you know, somebody in our audience asked a question about that. I didn't put it in my question list, but that does that have to do with how the machines read everything? Yes. They can't see black? Yes, that, that's what I learned. Michael, maybe there's an update, but the last time I took a tour of the facility, that's what I learned, you know, the reason why they don't recycle black. There, yeah, there's um, there are a couple of different reasons and, and um, Brian Ben is another expert in this area, but um, there's a couple of different reasons. One of them is the sorting. The other is frankly, um, when you put black back into being recycled, it creates an unpleasant color as far as the manufacturers are concerned. So it has a much lower value. So it's just crazy. I mean, so I, I do wanna, I'm gonna be relatively quick because I think Dave and Terry may also have a point of view about how, how to participate in this, but I'll, I'll just say two quick things. One, I think there is what we can do as citizens. One of the simplest things that any of us can do is opt for our electric bill to be 100% green energy. So. You, if you didn't do anything with your electric bill, then because we created, thanks to Dave Pine uh, and others, Peninsula Clean Energy, 50% of your electrons are coming from renewable resources automatically, unless you opted out, which I bet you didn't. But what you might not have known is that you could opt up. So you could opt that all 100% of your electrons are coming from wind or water or renewable resources, but you have to positively make that decision. And then that adds a few pennies to your monthly electric bill. But what that does in the market is start sending a signal to PG&E and others that we need more green energy, we need less uh, of the uh, fossil fuel energy. So that is one of the, you know, an important step that an individual can take. And then all of us living, you know, buying organic, buying local, that helps. I think after that, to be honest, I think the, the action does start to shift to larger organizations. So I think the county and the work that Dave and others are doing to, on sea level rise and at the state. So here's the dirty truth about California energy. We can convert everything to electricity and feel good about ourselves, but 52% of the electrons in the state of California are made by natural gas. So you can tell yourself you're driving an electric car and you have an all electric range but 50% of those electrons are coming from natural gas. So we at the state have to change the way electricity is made. And that isn't something Burlingame can do all by itself. It is something that Peninsula Clean Energy is trying to help with, but frankly, we need to work at the state level and we all need to just um, you know, take the decision that we want actually clean energy, clean carbon-free electricity. Um, Dave, so Dave, you uh, created this opportunity with Peninsula Clean Energy, right? Um, how would the people on this call do exactly what Michael just said in terms of voting to make your power yeah. bill a little bit more expensive so that you could be using 100% clean energy? Yeah, it's very simple. I mean, if you just uh, Google Peninsula Clean Energy and, and, and you can, the, the webpage will guide you through it really just take you a minute or two to change your account and opt for 100% um, clean energy, you know, for just a very small extra price. Um, it's actually been uh, difficult to get people to opt up to do that, um, which is surprising to me. And many people in Burlingame, um, including the Citizens Environmental Council, have done a lot of advocacy 
try to convince residents to take advantage of this uh, of this option. But uh, you know, people kind of get stuck in their ways, and um, it's it's it, we need more people to do it. It's it's very really, really simple, and for fortunately for many of us, uh, it's affordable. Well, I will tell you that I did it because a BHS student made a presentation at BIS to the parent group, and that inspired me to get my act together and do it. So Amazing. sent good messengers. Um, let's, since I have you, Dave, let's talk about SFO. Um, when people think about sea level rising, you think about SFO. Yeah. Um, what's the plan to protect our airport as well as the other businesses in the East Corridor of Burlingame? Yeah, let me start off on this and Michael Brownwick can add in as, as well. You know, sea level rise is one of the most consequential changes that we're going to see due to our warming of the climate. And even if we just stopped all carbon emissions now, we just have so much heat baked into the system that um, you know, young people today will, will see the bay rise by three feet by the turn of the century, perhaps much more. So it turns out that San Mateo County is the most vulnerable county in the entire state to, uh, to sea level rise. And that's because we've built to the edge of the bay or in many cases like SFO right you know, on top of the bay. So you look at SFO and Redwood Shores and Foster City. So with respect to SFO, um, they've been thinking about this challenge for the better part of a decade, and they have an ambitious plan to protect the airport. It's a $600 million project. Uh, they have about eight miles of shoreline uh, that, that uh, surrounds the airport, and they envision, you know, basically putting sheet pile walls uh, around many, most, most of the airport to protect against the rising bay waters. So they have a plan. It's an environmental review. They also are fortunate that they have revenue, at least once, once airline traffic returns again, they'll have revenue to pay for this. So uh, I'm very confident that the airport will stay dry. Now the bigger challenge is how, we, how do we keep what's south of our, what, 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 keeping, keeping, the, keeping Burlingame and Millbrae and San Bruno dry. So, you know, we don't want it, uh, people need to get to the airport too. So. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you want to speak a little bit to the burning game vulnerabilities. Um, well, yeah. So for us, um, obviously, all of us probably feel this way being on the call that the that the planet is, you know, under threat. Um, and so it's the right thing to do for um, for the planet. It, it is absolutely the right thing to do for burling game. Um, we face an existential threat. One third of our city's revenue that pays for our parks, pays for our sidewalks, pays for our police, come from businesses that are over on the bay side, specifically the hotels, one third. And so if you have a foot and a half of sea level rise and a king tide and a storm, you now have one third of, we now have one third of our economy underwater and that's not sustainable. So we recognize that um, several years ago and began a working group to look at ways we can defend Burlingame. So this is not to say that we should, any of us stop trying to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. We absolutely have to do that. But as Dave says, we also have to think about defending against the rise that is baked in. Um, and it's gonna be a significant impact to the city, the budget impact. Um, so we need to, you know, it's, um, a little like saving for college. You know, we can't wait till it's time to go to college to start thinking about how we're gonna pay for it. We need to start putting money away now and start working with property owners over there. The good news is we have a very close working relation, two good news. One, we have a very close relationship with SFO. So we're learning from them. We have very much the same kind of geometry. You know, the Bayside was all landfill. It's a great story. I won't bore you with it, but it's a very funny historical story. If you ever, well, so if you ever, if you were here long enough and you remember 280 getting built, if you ever wondered what happened to the dirt in 280, or if you wonder what happened to the old San Mateo bridge that got blown up and rebuilt, you're walking on it when you're over on our bay side. <laughs> so, um, Good story. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so, it's all, so we have the same kind of landfill that SFO does. We're going to have to defend it the same way. Um, and, and I just want to give one last shout out to Dave, 
uh, which is gonna sound like I'm part of the fan club or something, but uh, Dave helped um, create a, a flood. I can never remember the stupid acronym, Dave. It is a bit, that, that's bit one of a thing, tongue twister. That's one thing you didn't do. <laughs> Unlike Congress, which is constantly coming up with good acronyms for their bills, we, we have a really hard one. But anyway, it's all about coordinating flood and sea level rise. And it's a point that Jackie Spear makes, which is, you know, if the city of Belmont or the city of Burlingame try to go to Washington and get any anybody to pay attention, nobody's going to pay attention. Sure, sure. But together, which is yeah. what this district does, we can have a much stronger voice and and lobby for ourselves. So, and by the way, yeah. um, we're also uh, lucky enough to have our other council member, Donna Coulson. I should have said this before. Member, she's a member both of Peninsula Clean Energy and a member of the new flood district that Dave helped create. And so, uh, this is fantastic. front and center. Front and center yeah, it's one of them. these. It's one of these issues that you know we're going to have to face for many generations to come. We don't know, you know, how much water is coming our way. We know it's a lot, but uh, you know, we formed this new flood and sea level rise district so we can try to, you know, build the expertise and take the long view. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. I have a couple more questions. I'm hoping our panelists can give us good, concise answers because I want to know the answer to these questions before we wrap up. Um, this one is for you, Terry. I have heard, and someone else mentioned it on this call, that our city has recently placed a limit on natural gas in new construction. Can you explain why Burlingame made this a priority? And related to that, can you talk briefly about electrification? Sure can. Um, so Burlingame is one of more than city, 40 cities in the state that has placed some restrictions on natural gas in new construction. And the reason is that this is one of the fastest and best ways to get fossil fuels out of our energy sources. It um, is also much safer. I didn't know this, but those gas stoves and heaters are leaking this methane type gas that is dangerous for you. And they've done studies that show that it leads to asthma and all kinds of respiratory problems. And they measure air indoor, sometimes the quality is much worse than what would be considered pollution outdoors. It's also dangerous to have these things in your home. I mean, you've heard about the you know random um, explosions of pipelines like in San Bruno, but these, the system of, of gas, of the gas structure is so antique and jerry-rigged, it is really dangerous and there are leaks all the time. I talked to an inspector who was doing a home um, inspection and, and she said she often finds that these older appliances are leaking this toxic gas. So the other thing is that um, it is actually less expensive to build a new ha uh, home or building without a secondary gas um, system in it. So you think about it saves on the construction costs. Over time, it's much cheaper to have. And the, the big thing, the thing that this, I think is so important is that, you know, this movement has, it's, the train has left the station. The state is really moving strongly to a policy of no fossil fuels in homes or buildings, I should say. And um, I'm not sure when it's gonna happen, but if you are doing some new construction, you do not wanna put in another gas appliance, another gas water heater. You wanna go with um, the electric versions. And also you can do the solar plus batteries. There are, um, there's a county program through PCE that has wonderful rebates on deals on those kinds of things. So, um, you know, it doesn't make sense. My water heater went out um, earlier this, or last year, I guess it was now. And I put in um, a, an electric water heater. They're called heat pump water heaters. And it's great. It's just, it works perfectly. And I'm now I'm not worried about if, you know, another appliance goes out, I will replace it with electric also. The other thing about the, the, um, the heating systems, they have these, what they call mini splits. You can put them in every room. You can have with these electric heating system, also an air conditioning system at the same time, which is 
really nice when it gets very hot during the summer. Sure. So I know there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, many people say, oh, you know, I would miss the um, cooking with my gas stove. I was like that too. And then I tried one of these induction cooktops. You can now borrow one from the city. They have a program for that and try it out yourself. And you will find it is a marvelous way to cook faster, safer. Um, Donna Colson talks about when her cat leapt up on <laughs> and it didn't, you know, didn't get burned because it wasn't, it wasn't That's cat friendly. Yeah. So, I mean, there are many reasons I could go on, but this, um, the group that's working on this issue, which we call reach codes, it also involves getting electric vehicle infrastructure is so big in two counties, San Mateo and Santa Clara. I have never seen a movement this strong before. This is really powering this whole change in our state. And I think it will go nationwide because it really does answer. I knew we were going to have so much more to talk about than we yeah. have time to talk about it. Seagal, I'm going to give you the last question and we have about 30 seconds for you to answer it. Everybody on this call is on this call because they're action oriented. They want to do something about climate change. So we all received mailings and Terry gave all these great recommendations. Does the city or the county have a list of vendors or recommendations that they endorse? Where do people go to funnel out all the noise and really get to what do they need to do? And you have 30 seconds. Sure. We don't endorse specific companies. We don't have a list that people can use. But if you're looking for things to do, like Michael said, go to Peninsula Clean Energy and opt up for your electricity. During the fall, we run this program called Bay Area SunShares for installing solar on homes. And that program vets the contractors. So they select three contractors region wide and you know those are vetted and could work for you. But that, that's only during a short duration of time. Otherwise, if you want solar panels, I recommend looking on Google Earth, seeing which one of your neighbors has it, knocking on their door, seeing <laughs> if they like their vendors. Because it's true, there's a lot of vendors out there and it's hard to know which ones are legit and the good ones and so on. But, um, but I, I urge everyone to, to check out solar for your homes, to get cleaner energy. And, um, and you could look at the county and the city's website and contact us if you have specific questions about directions to go. And no black plastic in the blue. No bin. black plastic. Do your best. <laughs> <laughs> Make those smart uh, packaging choices. <laughs> so on that note, I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight. I appreciate the intelligence you brought to this um, conversation and the handy tips you've given all of us to walk away with so that we can take action. Uh, to our Burlingham audience, I really hope that you found this discussion stimulating and informative and future focused. We have two more future of Burlingame programs ahead in March, March 24th and May 19th. We're going to be talking about business growth and the quality of life, the future, the quality of life in Burlingame. And you can register for those programs soon by going to www.bceendowment.org. Um, and you can also go to that website and become a Founders Circle member of the BC Endowment. So convenient. If you believe in Burlingame, if you believe in the value of Burlingame's great schools, it's just a wonderful way to sustain the Burlingame community for many years to come. So I really do encourage your support of our BC Endowment campaign. So far, we've raised over $250,000 since its inception, but we, need, we really need your help to get to our $2 million endowment fund goal. Um, many thanks to all the organizations who have um, helped us put together this program tonight. Um, we've got a slide showing all of them. There we are, um, takes a village. And I wanna uh, make a special shout out to our panelists, um, Supervisor Dave Pine, Council Member Michael Brownrigg, Seagal Michael, Terry Nagel, and Rusty Hopewell. Thank you all for joining us and have a good night.
was great.